Coming from London, the brand new revised Peter Ross Show. My special guest today is a man who's been in the bands Bad English and The Babies. From California, I'm talking to John Waite. It's really great to speak to John Waite. What's the weather like in California at the moment, John? It's a bit of a cast. Yeah? Um, the June and July months are, are gloomy. It's got a lot of, um, you know, the atmosphere is kind of overcast, so it's not quite sunny. But we have lovely days, but um, it's been hot, you know, it's been hot everywhere, but I'm looking forward to winter. Now, tell me something, what does what a boy in Lancaster, born in Lancaster, think about yeah. living in California? Well, the greatest thing about Santa Monica is that it's like little England. Mm. It's England with palm trees. There's two English pubs, the King's Head and the Britannia. There's an English tea room. There's um, sort of uh, a, an art film theatre on Second Street. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are that would appeal to the English, and it's that a lot of English people live here. So it's kind of all right to live here, but I prefer New York. You do? I came, yeah, I came here for a break for a year, and then I um, went on tour and for some mad reason bought a place. But it's a lovely, great big, you know, it's 2,000 square feet. Right. It's a, it's, it's a big... Um, the loft. It suits me, but uh, I would like to live back on the East Coast again. I miss New York City pretty much all the time, actually. Do you go back very often? New York City? Yeah. Every chance I get. Right. We play there quite a bit and right. get drive through it when we're going to like Boston or going south to Florida. You just have to go through I-95, which is a, a stretch of highway that goes from the north to the south on the east eastern seaboard but manhattan really truly is home it's where you feel me. after lancaster <laughs> yeah. lancaster's the most that's where i come from and that's that i go back three times a year I, i'm a lancastrian but i think in my spirit in my heart it, it really is new york city now we've got we've got you've got a brand new album out called live all access where was this recorded well we started recording it in um in philly mm -hmm. in south philly uh which is in a blue collar area where there's a church called uh, Philly Sound, mm -hmm. and it's a church converted into a recording studio. There's a recording studio in the next room from the main chapel, mm -hmm. and the nave is the stage, and it holds about 400 people. Mm -hmm. And they record string quartets, rock bands, make albums, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but we decided to work there as the bass player, Tim Hogan is from Philly, and mm -hmm. knew this guy that owned the place, right. Drew. And I decided to have two days off, go down there, uh, invite an audience over the radio, buy three kegs of beer a night, right. make it a free concert, and record the band. The band was playing really well. And uh, I managed to get, uh, I think, three songs out of the two nights, um, or four. But the heat was so much that we were going out of tune. Right. It was just like being in the cavern, you know, in Liverpool or something. It was just so many people crowded in. It was a great night. So I gave up for a couple of months and let the band develop a bit more because we had a new guitar player, Kerry Kelly. And um, after about six weeks, two months, we really were having tremendous gigs, and I just couldn't stop myself. I went and uh, recorded some more shows on the road, mm -hmm. which is even riskier, yeah. really, because yeah. you're at the mercy of the guy doing the house sound, too. But this guy in Manchester, New Hampshire, had all this German boutique recording equipment, right. and we had a spectacular gig. Yeah. We had the best gig we'd played that, that far. And I got two-thirds of the concert onto the record. And it, it, it wasn't about making a greatest hits record. It wasn't about trying to sell the past, yeah. you know. There's a couple of songs on that you'll know. A lot of it's from the last album, Rough and Tumble. Yeah. But it's about the performance and the singing and the songs and the band intera interacting. You feel the atmosphere when you listen to the yeah. album. Yeah, well, you know, we, it isn't one of those things where we finish a song and the audience gets, like, double track. Mm. We're not, you know, we're not trying to make it sound like it wasn't. Mm. The, 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 these are hardcore fans, like, who cheer for, like, you know, five seconds, then wait for the next song. Yeah. So um, that's how I treated it. It was just simply like, this is song A, B, C, D, and E, you yeah. know? But there's no overdubs of right. any sort right. at all. It's and, pure. Uh, it's pure, yeah. 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 And that's what I, I think in this day and age, it's almost the antithesis of what's going on. And I think it's why I made the record. Right. Everybody's playing along to tapes. Yeah. It's all arena rock. It's a big business. God bless them. <laughs> it makes a lot of people happy. But 
when you go and see the Stones play, they're playing live, you yeah, know. And, it's, yeah. uh, and when you heard those great albums from the 70s, the live albums, they were all completely live too. So what's your favourite uh, track from this particular album? Let's play a track now. What's your favourite track from this album? Well, I think Evil would be um, one, of, one of my favourites. I think it just rocks like hell. Uh, we're talking to John Waite today, Evil, from uh, the brand new album, Live All Access. Uh, we were saying just before we played that, John, that, uh, about the fact that it's a pure album, it's not overdubbed, it is just, uh, right. it's genuine, isn't it? Yeah, well, there's only three people on stage playing an instrument. Yeah. I used to play a second guitar, and then they voted that I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've got a great sense of rhythm, but I get lost in the song. Yeah. I'm a better singer when I'm not actually playing. Yeah. Um, it's a three-piece band. It's just like those bands you would see in the 70s before mm. the synthesizer came along. So it's a very simple band. You have to really fight your corner, mm. as they say in boxing. You have to really know what you're doing. And it took us a while to find that place. But once we found it, we, we really felt at home there. It's, it's, it's just a whole different experience playing live. John, let me take you back to 1978 when you were in the Babies. Yeah. Um, something comes to mind. If if Chrysalis Records hadn't have had Blondie and Pat Benatar, do you yeah. think do you think the course of history might have been a bit different? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I look at the, the babies were were huge in America. Mm -hmm. We sold out everywhere we played. We had a massive following. And the Head First album, we had two major singles off that: Head First and Every Time I Think of You. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, AM rec, uh, radio played the softer stuff. Mm -hmm. And you no, know, FM played the hard stuff and AM played the, the softer stuff. And on FM, we had head first the track, mm -hmm. like at number one. Mm -hmm. And every, t every time I think of you on AM was also number one. Right. You, you couldn't be going anywhere between gigs and play the radio and not hear the babies. And um, Chrysalis just dropped the ball. Mm. I mean, it's one of those things that just comes around once in a while. And we, we staggered on for two more records, but that was really, that was hard to take. Yes. That was, really was that a low point in your life? No, we were having a ball playing live. I mean, that's the great thing about being young. Yeah. When you're driving into New York City and, and you've seen it for the first time, or yeah. you're going to Dallas, uh, you know, you're 25. And so you're just glad to be there. Yeah. So I think... The real depression set in sort of after the next album when we realized that they just didn't care. Right. Or if they cared, they couldn't get it right. Yeah. You couldn't find a baby's record in the stores. We, we, we'd go into towns and think, Christ, was sold out. Mm. Great. But the record had never been there. Falling in love was the last thing I had on my mind. We were massive on the radio and had this huge following, but somebody really... Su just really, I'm trying not to use the F word yeah. here, but somebody really uh, yeah. messed up. Mucked up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's often the case, though, that, that you find that uh, record companies don't really appreciate the artists that they have. They look at you more as a commodity rather well, than... Well, yeah, it's a yeah. music business. Yeah. And I can't think of two more opposite things. Yeah. You have an artist and a businessman in the same room yeah. and a table between you, if you're lucky. Yeah. But I, 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 when I go into someone's office, which I rarely do, I always feel like I'm going through security at the airport. <laughs> you know, it's, I think I'm going to get strip searched. It's just terrible, you know? Who was your inspiration when you first started out? Oh, God, Marty Robbins. All right. Uh, Western songs, um, gunfighter ballads and trail songs. Right. I used to run down the hill from my old school to catch the bus home. Mm. And in Kenneth Gardner's window, mm. there was this day glow red album with the gunfighter on the front. I used to stand there, all three feet of me, and look at it. And it, it was America, mm. you know. A couple of years ago, Alison Krauss yeah, yeah, yeah. Found, found the original album, had it framed, yeah. and gave it to me for Christmas. Yeah. But that's what really started me off was Western songs. How did you get involved with Alison Krauss? Uh, I called her up. Yeah. I just said, I'm doing this duet. You know, I, I, you're my favorite singer. And um, it was the beginning of a long association. I mean, uh, she's, she's great. And Mike Shipley, that's just passed away, mm. he mixed it. Mm. And uh, it would be a touching thing to play it. Let's, let's play it now, Missing You with Alison Krauss and you, of course. Every time I think of you, That's Alison Krauss with uh, John Waite and Missing You, of course, originally hit in 1984. And this was recorded, when was this recorded, John? Um, oh 
God, about four years ago. Right, 2001. It was when they were making Raising Sound. Ah, right. It was when Robert Plant uh, was in the picture. I kept right. seeing Robert everywhere I went. Right. And uh, me and Alison became kind of very friendly, and I used to sort of spend hours sitting around with Robert talking about music and also It was a very pleasant period, you know. Did you ever think about uh, recording a, a ballad or anything with uh, Tina Turner? No, uh, it wouldn't occur to me. We no. did Sweet Red Allen Red. Yeah. One of her songs on my last album, Rough and Tumble. Yeah. And she covered Missing You. Yes, yeah. And I've always been a fan of hers. Yeah. But um, I think the voices wouldn't blend. I don't know, maybe they would. I, I, you can't honestly tell until you get in the room with somebody what's going to happen. Do you think she, she uh, is mad with you because uh, the Missing You uh, knocked her off the number one spot with <laughs> What's Love Got to no, Do With It? No, 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 no. I, I saw her the week before... I was number one, and I was at a party reception in New York City, yeah. and she was sat in the corner having a drink of champagne, and I walked over and politely introduced myself and said that next week I get to be number one, and uh, I, I've loved your work since I was a kid, yeah. and which, you know, and I, I had, you know, yeah. and that uh, it was an honour to to be in the same room. Yeah. I think um, I think it was a nice thing to say. She's a great girl. The live album that you have, uh, uh, live yeah. all access. When yeah. you when you were actually recording this and you were you were you know you were playing uh, on stage, did you mind yeah. go back to 1980 in Cincinnati when you were pulled off the stage? It doesn't go back there. No. But I, but uh, but generally when I'm singing a song, uh, you can be in front of 10,000 people singing about something, and really you're you're stood on a street corner mm. talking to a girl mm. in 1995 mm. in New York City, maybe. Mm. And in your, inside your head, you're there in front of 10,000 people. Mm. In, in the theater, they call it the fourth wall. Right. You know, you're not supposed to look through the fourth wall. Right. But a rock singer has to because he's, he is the audience. It's like being at the, the cinema, you know, yeah. but it's an interior experience. Um, but I did get pulled off stage. It was... Um, next to the last gig the babies did and it was basically the end of the babies really. Yeah. Were you worried? Were you frightened or nervous or what happened when you actually got got pulled off? Did they pull you back straight well, away? I, I, well I, it's happened a couple of times right. um, but um, that time I injured my knee yeah. and I couldn't walk after that and we right. did one more gig in Akron. I remember it was Akron because um, Chrissy Hind is from there right. and I remember making a mental note of well at least I'm going out in Chrissy Hind's <laughs> city yeah. and uh, from there I went to New York to go to hospital and then I flew home for Christmas but yeah. the band was finished then yeah. that was the end of the band every time I think of you was it an e easy transition to go solo after you'd been in bands um, it never occurred to me I never really looked at it as um, two different things I always play with people I like hmm. and people that inspire me yeah and it's always a band that travels together. Mm -hmm. It's always the band that's on stage together and the singer. I probably write all the songs mm. um, and I have a huge catalogue. But I like being part of a unit. I mean, I, I'd be nowhere without the band. If you gave me a ukulele, yeah. it'd just be me and the ukulele, you know. If yeah. you give me a rock band, then I'm, I become everything I'm supposed to be. Uh, what other track can we play, John? Well, I think since it's a rock, rock album, I think Saturday Night would be great. <laughs> John Wade, Saturday night uh, from the album Live All Access uh, from uh, Santa Monica, California. Uh, John is speaking to me at the moment. Uh, we are in England uh, via a hard drive all over the world and worldwide. Uh, John, may I just ask you, uh, what are you doing after you've uh, finished promoting this uh, particular album? Well, we don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, there's a country band called Love and Theft. Mm -hmm. that have recorded a song called If You Ever Get Lonely right. um, that I wrote with Kyle Cook mm -hmm. from Matchbox 20. Mm. And they're the 47 at the moment with a bullet on the country charts. Mm -hmm. and they had a number one single last year. Mm -hmm. If You Ever Get Lonely is on the new live album. It's a pretty great version, really. Right. And we just released a remastered single right. from the album right. to iTunes yesterday. Right. You know, anything could happen. If, if, if I was moves up the charts we win if theirs moves up the charts we win the last album i put out we had a number one single at classic rock in america mm -hmm. uh, but we were on the road playing clubs every night and mm -hmm. going to radio every day mm -hmm. so 
can only do that for a year before you just burn out, mm. and it's very expensive. Mm. I couldn't do that again to save my life. No. But it's, I'm interested in the fact that Love and Theft have recorded the song, mm -hmm. and I think our version is, is really, it's like one of those things where you think, you know, if I get run over tomorrow, at least I sang that. Yeah. I mean, I, I sang it like, I mean, it's a good, it's good. So um, I haven't got any plans other than to release another live record, hopefully, in the next eight months, volume two. Yeah. And at the end of the year, towards September, I hope to start cutting tracks for studio records. There's always something. We've, before we got on the phone today, I was listening back to cassettes and making notes, and on my iPhone, I've got a microphone that records music, and I'm transferring it all off the cassettes mm. onto the iPhone. Mm. And there's some beautiful stuff. It's, I didn't expect it. I don't really sit down to write songs. They just come to me out of the blue. So I have to play sort of catch-up and mm. put it all together. So it's a bit of a, a, a chore, really, for me, but once I get going, I love it. What sort of volume are we talking about, songs that you've totally written that maybe haven't been released as well? Well, I don't know. Maybe, um, oh, not that many, because I, I usually finish what I start. Right. But there's a couple of duds from the bad English period that we just couldn't make work. We were collectively just jumping in and trying to write anything. Mm -hmm. But maybe 50 songs that didn't make it in a career, and maybe... 200 plus songs that did make it so when you think about what it takes to sit down and write a song mm. it's quite a catalogue really do you become emotionally attached to the songs that you write i can't uh, well how could you not yeah. i mean the thing is it's it's almost involuntary yeah i mean i i i'm a pretty uh you know all my my time i i read a lot and yeah. i'm i'm very interested in the written word and i, and I like to read well-written things and also, I, I love music. Mm -hmm. I like a heart, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm always thinking about phrases and the difficulty of relationships and maybe even religion mm -hmm. or the state of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, the, um, the home badger roaming around our English fields, you know, I mean, the bee. Mm -hmm. I think about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, when you go into songwriting, there's this other thing, this, is, this, this, this uh, other me, that, that you take the armor off. And then you really get going. You know, you really sort of throw down. Um, but it's it's wicked. It's 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 a it's a hell of a way to spend a month. You know, making a record. Yeah. But um, when it's when it's going right, it's almost uh, a spiritual experience. You know, I mean, it's it's it matters. It really matters. Writing pop songs, that's Tin Pan Alley. And then there's everything else that matters. Mm. You know. Mm. You you said you had an interesting story about it. If you ever get lonely. Well, the fact that. Um, the country band Love and Theft have cut it, and uh, they might have a... They're 47 with a bullet, yeah. and they might just crack the top 10 because they were number one last year. Right. There's a huge amount of acts in front of them. They've, they've hit this sort of bottleneck where everybody's got a record out, mm. and um, it, Nashville is just like L.A. now. It's changed completely. Mm -hmm. So it, it might be tough, but it might, the song is so good that I think they, and they've done a good version. I'm, I'm thinking they might have a hit. We've released it at the same time on a live album, um, which is a great performance. And it was written about the real thing. It wasn't an imaginary situation. It was drawn from real life. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it means a lot to me. It was, you know, it's meant to be a phone call that you get late at night from somebody that has really had the extra glass of wine they shouldn't have had or they hit the speed dial with your name still on it, and you pick the phone up, and they're just sort of like, hey, how you doing, you know? And you're just barely getting by. So it's, it's about two worlds colliding, and um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty desperate song, really, but it's beautiful. Thanks for calling. If you ever get lonely, John Waite, John Waite, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this album is a really, as we said before, it's a pure album. It's from the heart. Uh, there are no overdubs. It's, it's just a genuine piece of work, isn't it? Yeah, that was the intention. I didn't really want to... Um, there's no other way of doing it for me. I, it's the antithesis of arena rock, and I think there's a swing back to that. Um, there's a lot of bands now that are just... I, I, what I noticed at Glastonbury... Mm. Uh, I was back in England watching it on TV, mm. but there's a lot of people playing acoustic guitar, mm. which is always a great sign. Mm. Um, there was no raging guitar solos. You know, it was it was it wasn't arena rock. The big bands, it, it was something else. And um, I think there's a swing back to originality and honesty. And I think the big arena rock bands are so full of it, 
and I think people are beginning to realize how full of it they are, that there is a swing back to being all natural, you know. Mm. And I think that the great charm in that is the humanity. Mm. If your voice breaks when you're really going for it, mm. it's more emotional. Mm. Mm. Um, but it's tough, you know, to be in a, a four-piece band with, with three, three, only three people playing an instrument. You've got to be completely on your game. And you can't take your eye off the ball for a second. You just cannot. And it, and it requires a higher level of um, musicality, and uh, you've got to be really committed. And the older I get, and the more work that I put behind me, it's like playing Russian roulette in a, in a more lightweight way. Mm -hmm. it's, um, I prefer the thrill of going out there stripped down mm. than going out there with a mass band mm. and backup singers and uh, just cruising. I think I'd stay at home at that point. In my life. Who, who do you listen to then, John, when you're not listening to your own music? Alison Krauss I always loved. I like Bluegrass. I like um, Larry Sparks. I like um, Eric Satie, the uh, composer from the late 18th century. Yeah. Um, I listen to uh, Bill Evans, the jazz keyboard player. Uh, I listen to a lot of old blues, Howl Howling Wolf. Yeah. Uh, if I'm listening to British rock, it would probably be kind of more free, uh, Mott the Hoople, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Humble Pie, Steve Marriott had a big effect on me. I met Steve once and sang with him in a club, right. and it was the highlight of, so. of my year. Um, you know, th there's just something that happened in the, in, this, in the 70s before it went big business. Yeah. It was really significant that Rich stayed with me. I was only in my teens, but I think that's when things make the biggest impression on you. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And before that, I had the Beatles and the Stones. Yeah. Bob Dylan still wrecks my world. Yeah. I listen to Dylan and I just stand back from the speakers, you know, yeah. I mean, what can you do? Yeah. I was talking to Justin Hayward the other week and Justin was saying that uh, in the 60s when he was um, obviously signed to Lonnie Donegan on that uh, deal, but he was, he, <laughs> he, 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 he was a little bit bitter, um, but um, what I was going to say is that, that the Beatles were the governors. Yeah, they were. they were. There was nobody bigger, nobody fresher. Um, I, was th I was doing this interview yesterday about songwriting, mm -hmm. and they asked me um, what my influences were, and I said, well, it was kind of Celtic, because mm. there was this atonal uh, folk singing thing going on in Britain, and, which was going alongside Skiffle, mm. London Onigan, <laughs> and all those guys were singing these songs, mm. and it was on the acoustic with an upright bass, or a tea chest bass, or whatever, and a washboard and all that, but there was... There was the Dubliners, and those are these these people singing story songs. Yeah, and then there was American rock. Yeah. you know, and the two somehow got together. And I can hear it in the Beatles, "Love Me Do" and "Please Please Me" and the harmonies. Yeah. Paul McCartney going for those kind of Celtic notes. Yeah. and um, I think a lot of it, the Beatles were the absolute kings of it. But when they started out, I could hear the roots of the fifties really really clearly to me. I never realized till I did this interview yesterday um, how clear it had been to me. I just didn't acknowledge it. Your live album, Live All Access, is out now. It's available on iTunes. It's available in record stores as well. Can I just ask you, going back to 1984, what was the inspiration yeah. behind Missing You? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd split up for my wife. And I was living in a suitcase in L.A. making the No Breaks record. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'd been uh, in New York the previous uh, 18 months, maybe a year, I'd met someone uh, as my life was sort of coming out of control. And um, was that Brit Eklund? Was, was that Brit Eklund? Was that Brit Eklund? Oh no, that was that was the babies. That was way before. Oh right, okay. Look at look at this. All these blondes, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. But yeah. I mean, that was that was just whatever. You know, <laughs> right, okay. Next, yeah. but. Um, but I'd, it was, it was, I'd, I'd met, there was about three different women. It was about distance. I, I, I made the, up the entire first verse, first bridge and chorus without stopping, on the spot, singing over somebody else's track. And I used the opening line of a baby song, Every Time I Think of You, yeah. just to get started. Yeah. And, it, and as soon as I sang, Every Time I Think of You, then I sang, I always catch my breath, and I'm still standing here in your mouth away, and I'm wondering why you left. Yeah. And there's a storm that's raging through my frozen heart tonight. I ain't missing you at all since you've been gone, since you've been gone away. I made that up without stopping. Yeah. And I was so overwhelmed. I stood back from the mic 
and I can't even begin to tell you what it felt like. Yeah. But I felt like I'd been sort of punched. Yeah. I couldn't get a, I couldn't get my next breath. It was so emotional, and I think I was trying to survive this upcoming divorce thing with my wife, and I, and I was missing New York City and this girl, and I was sort of. It was really a, a torn song about denial, but mm. I didn't have any intention when I sang the first line to wind up singing that in the chorus. Mm. And that's, again, where songwriting comes, comes at you. It's such a, a spiritual, weird thing. You're just a conduit. I mean, mm. Keith Richards says you just stand there and you're like a radio receiver. Mm. And believe me, son, that's what you are. I mean, it's a wonderful thing, but... I don't understand anything about it. Well, John Waite, you've been fantastic today from California. Thank you. All the best with live all access. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, and my pleasure too. Thank you. Every time I think of you.